our next uh, on the agenda is, is an important uh, presentation. And, and, and I think uh, a lot of the, the, the folks here in, in, uh, in attendance this morning, you know, recruiting good candidates, good multicultural candidates for your corporations, for your organizations, and then keeping them. Yes, recruiting them, getting them there, and then retaining them. That's important. Uh, it's important for everyone, I think, here in the audience, no matter what you're doing. If it's politics, you want the voters. If it's, if it's Comcast, you want, you want the employees, and you want uh, specialists that, uh, that look like uh, the, the new communities out there. So we, we, we want to bring a case study, uh, and it's going to be presented by a good friend of ours, uh, Colonel Eduardo Suarez, who is Director of Communications uh, for the Minnesota National Guard. And uh, that's very important. He's the first Latino to have served in that position. And so I've known Ed for quite a few years. You know, our company has been involved with the National Guard. Um, uh, I think about 10 years ago, they won an award for recruiting more Latinos than any other uh, Guard organization in the country. So we believe in the Guard. We believe uh, serving your country, but there's also so many benefits. Education is one of them. So without further ado, I've got a long um, introduction here, but we want to save time for the presentation. So Colonel Eduardo Suarez, Minnesota National Guard. How about a big hand? Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing so far? Yeah. All right, I'm looking forward to having this, uh, this dialogue. Uh, an opportunity to tell a story, the Minnesota National Guard. Uh, thank you, Rick, for this opportunity to, uh, to tell this unique story um, about recruiting and retaining talent in disruptive times. Um, and I'm joined here by some folks from our team, um, our public relations officer. I have Lieutenant Colonel Chris Inoje here with us today. Um, I've got Lieutenant Colonel Corey Robbins. He's our Director of Diversity and Inclusion. I've got Command Chief Warrant Officer Eric Hami. He leads, uh, he's our Executive Champion for our Special Emphasis Council for our Hispanic and Latinx uh, Council. And then I have Sergeant First Class Daphne Awasanya. Uh, she's a recruiter and also a former team, a marketing team for our recruiting battalion. So I'm happy to have them here as well. Uh, this, uh, this opportunity today is gonna talk about a lot of our successes and challenges. And I'll just say this, you know, we're not done facing and navigating the challenges that exist today. Uh, today's presentation is really going to hone in on other things I think that we can affect as an organization. Um, but there's outside factors that affect the recruiting process. Uh, it's the, the military entrance exam process is difficult. A lot of our applicants struggle with height weight issues. Uh, so there's a number of things that we just can't affect entirely. But today, I, I hope you get a few uh, nuggets to take back with you and how you navigate your own internal challenges that relates to recruiting and retention. Um, we're going to talk about events prior to uh, the unrest in 2020 and COVID of those years. Um, and I want to give you some background on the National Guard. Uh, you know, one of the classic uh, uh, things to remember is that you, know, you have to understand your audience. So I don't want to assume everyone here knows what the National Guard is. And so I'll give you a quick overview of what that looks like. So uh, we'll go ahead and get started here. Uh, let's see if this is going to work. It does. There's the agenda for today. Again, we'll give a quick little one-on-one -on -one brief on who the Guard is. I'll quickly talk about what was life like prior to 2021 and what we were doing there as an organization. Then I'll quickly spend the most of our time talking about sort of the lessons and learn as we navigated through the unrest of 2020 and the, the pandemic and whatnot and where we are today and where we're going moving forward. Here's some quick takeaways that I hope you'll grab with the presentation today and we'll circle back at these at the end of the briefing. But if I were to kind of summarize these things in three general areas, Three questions, you know, are you prepared for that next black swan event, that next pandemic? You know, are you organization prepared to handle those challenges? Do you have the structures in place to deal with that? How well do you think you know your current market right now? And how well do you know the people, you know, organizations? It's just kind of think about those things as we go through the presentation. So let's talk about the Minnesota National Guard. Uh, now, normally this is like a 30 slide presentation, it takes about an hour to get through it. I'll try to do it in four slides in four minutes. So um, you can start to stop, stop watching now if you want, but we'll try our best. Uh, the, you know, the Guard was formed in, in, in 1856, and um, at the oldest annual report we have on record is from 1892. 
And during that time, the Guard consisted of, this is the Minnesota Guard, 10 companies of infantry, two troops of cavalry, two sections of artillery, a total strength of 844 soldiers. Now today, fast forward, and at your tables, there's our current annual report that talks about where we've come since that time. And now we're nearly 13,000 strong. Uh, Minnesota to put on the uniform, defend our state and our nation, and much has changed since the beginning of the Guard. Um, and take a look at the report throughout the presentation and afterwards take it home with you. It really does tell a beautiful story about the National Guard here in Minnesota. Like any good organization, we, uh, we have a vision that drives everything we do. Um, you know, we look at what the Minnesota Guard does in terms of uh, our support of global military operations. You know, our men and women, uh, the Minnesota Guard face increasingly demanding readiness requirements to ensure we can fight and win our nation's wars. And all the while, our commitment to support the civil authorities, the issues here in Minnesota is also really, really important for us. Um, and, you know, looking back at 2021, uh, it was an unprecedented time as we called up the National Guard, uh, over 7,000 people in state active duty to support those that time in need. So, you know, it is uh, really important to us as an organization that, that Minnesotans sees us at the most, as the most trusted institution um, in the state. Uh, this idea that we're always ready and always there is really important to us. And really, you think about it, uh, if we're going to meet our recruiting and retention challenges, uh, we have to be considered a trusted institution across the entire state. We have two missions in the National Guard, and this is how we differ between the reserve and active duty. Um, our National Guard serves both uh, our, our federal and state missions, so we serve the President of the United States and the Governor of Minnesota. That makes us uniquely different than, say, the reserves do. The reserves have only a federal mission. Um, and so we're really proud of the fact that we have the ability to respond to crisis here at home in Minnesota. And historically, in the last uh, 20 years, uh, with the beginning of the global war on terrorism, we've done an exceptional job in responding to our federal missions as well. So we're really proud to do that. And that couldn't have been done without this emphasis on recruiting and retaining our talent, having the ability to flex both missions, both state and federally. Uh, but as we look in uh, 2020, 2021, uh, with that record history of state uh, active duty, uh, it really stretches an organization and how we could respond to both. And I'm really proud of the fact that we were able to do exactly that. And so given our soldiers and airmen that uh, live and work in Minnesota, we have a special connection to the communities in which we serve and operate in. It's really important that you look across at the map here behind you or behind me, that we're reflective of the communities we serve in. And we're, we're spread across the entire state. 50 communities across the state of Minnesota, um, and we have a variety of units, um, and I'll just quickly go through them. Our Joint Force Headquarters is based here in St. Paul, um, up at Camp Ripley in central Minnesota, just near Little Falls. We have uh, what I consider one of the most prestigious training centers in the Midwest. Um, there we have co-located is a regional training institute where we train our future officers and NCO Corps. The 34th Infantry Red Bull Division is headquartered in in, um, uh, in Rosemont, uh, actually Arden Hills now. Um, it's also, if you look at the, the red bull on the screen there, it's one of the key, I think, branding icons that's most recognizable in the state of Minnesota right now. We have fighter wings both in Duluth, here in the cities for both cargo aircraft and fighters, and then a number of other units spread across the entire state. Um, and so, you know, back in the you know, pre-2000, I'd say probably back in the 80s and 90s, this idea of the hometown armory existed pretty strongly. We used to recruit locally. A lot of times it was family connected. So, you know, siblings and family members often would bring their own uh, service, uh, families to join the Minnesota Guard. And that model has changed over the years. You know, we recruit across the entire state right now. Our recruiters are based all over the state. But, you know, really a lot of our recruits come from the larger population centers. And so it's really important to understand how those areas are changing. We'll talk more about that in the presentation. So lastly, I'll talk about our organizational priorities. You know, these three priorities really focus in on our vision. Um, and really, these priorities haven't changed since 2021. Uh, now we're actually in the process of actually re retooling these priorities. But the bottom line is, these priorities drive our efforts across the entire organization, and our communication strategy is really tooled in ensuring that we're always communicating what is important to the National Guard and our leadership. And so we spend a lot of time, Chris's team spends a lot of time communicating that, and every interaction we have with the community 
uh, messages these priorities when, at every opportunity. Even like today, right now, we're doing a proclamation ceremony for Fairview Hospital to become a yellow ribbon company. And if you're interested in becoming a company, let me know after this. But again, in that opportunity, Governor Waltz will be there, and we're going to talk about these priorities and why it's important to partner with the, the state of Minnesota as a whole. We're always looking for ways to enable and care for our people and modernize our equipment, and our partners are part of that effort. Our people are our most important resource, um, and they're the center of every successful organization, ours and yours alike. So we spend a lot of uh, time ensuring not only for their welfare, but we obviously have to reach out to our employers as well. Uh, you know, our part-time force is about 10,000 strong, so the large majority of the organization has both a military obligation and a civilian obligation. So you can imagine how we ask so much of our members as they balance their military careers, their civilian careers, family responsibilities. It is a lot, and we recognize the importance that if you don't focus on people, you're going to lose the fight. Modernization mostly has to do with the fact that uh, as we become an operational reserve of the active duty, it's really important that our equipment is modernized and that we operate on parity with the active duty force to make sure that when we deploy in overseas that we're not only competent in our field and our craft, but we're using the same equipment the active duty is using as well. And lastly, I'll talk about partnerships. I can't emphasize enough the importance about partnerships. Um, you got to ask yourself as an organization, hey, do you live and exist in a vacuum? Or are you connected to your community at large? And we spend a lot of time partnering, not just at a state agency level with, say, Department of Public Safety, Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, we're at the community level as well. And I'll talk more about how our special emphasis councils, our ERGs, are part of that effort. But again, we strategically communicate these priorities at every opportunity, our media engagement, social media, storytelling, every chance we can get in front of the public we touch these priorities to ensure Minnesotans know what's important to us and more importantly, how much we value their support. So let's talk about life before the pandemic and the unrest. Um, this chapter of our story um, is, uh, is I'm most familiar with and I'll tell the story from the lens of my experience from 2020 or 2002 to 2020. I served in a variety of capacities. I was a traditional part-time soldier for a while and they became a full-time member. I deployed three times during this period. Um, I commanded the recruiting battalion uh, for three years leading up to the pandemic, and then I transitioned to the DNI director right about 2020. So when you hear my, uh, my comments, I'm reflecting on my time during, uh, during this, this period. So I call this preparing for war. Um, been around for a long time, 35 years of service, so I've kind of seen it and done it. 9-11 um, was certainly transformational for the entire country, obviously. But post-World War II, the National Guard was actually almost disbanded. And for decades following that war, and even through the Vietnam era, the National Guard was viewed mostly as a strategic reserve, meaning uh, the readiness levels, you know, the standards and equipment, we just weren't on par with the active duty. Active duty. There was a much different expectation for us then. And then 9-11 certainly changed everything for us. Um, prior to 9-11, a big emphasis on being supportive for our state and state emergencies. Uh, but when 9-11 happened, uh, everything changed for us. Um, and you got to think about it. We're part-time members primarily in the National Guard, but now more than ever, we're expected to meet the same standards as our active duty of counterparts. And most members in the Guard serve between 45 and 60 days a year, and the active duty has 365. But regardless of that, we have to meet the same medical requirements, height and weight standards, uh, standards in, in readiness and performance and equipment, all of it has to be met. We're really proud of the fact that during our time since post 9-11, uh, and many of us here have deployed, um, that we do it as well or better than active duty. I'm really proud to say that Minnesota Guard does it better than most. And so, uh, but big transformation for, for us prior to uh, the pandemic years. Uh, frequent and large deployments, became uh, commonplace, um, and the demands on our service members and our families and employers was never higher. During this period, two things happened. Um, there was a lot of outreach from the community saying, how can we help the Minnesota Guard deal with the challenges of deployment? And in 2006, through uh, efforts of the state legislature, we established the Beyond the Old Ribbon Reintegration Program, where we started to recognize how do we get families more resilient, 
So we train folks before and during and after deployments to help cope with the challenges of frequent deployments as we knew that this war on terror was gonna continue for a long time. And then shortly thereafter, we established the Yellow Ribbon Recognition Proclamation Program where we have community networks, companies become proclaimed that will support the veteran community. So all those collectively during that time period was about helping us uh, deal with the high deployments and keep us ready for war, at the same time being ready for our state missions. The focus during that time was on recruiting. Um, and I'll tell you, we did it better than most. In fact, uh, I would say that between 2001, 2002, up until about 2019, the battalion never failed its mission. And oftentimes, National Guard Bureau looked at us to make up the difference in other states we would actually overproduce in many of those years. Really proud of the fact that in 2008, we almost recruited 2,100 new soldiers uh, you know, into the formation. So the emphasis really was on recruiting. Uh, it wasn't so much on retention, uh, because we we're just focusing on meeting the demands of the deployments. Um, we actually just out-recruited our losses. That says a lot about how we were back in those days. We owned a lot of the market share during that period. Um, the propensity to serve was pretty high in Minnesota at that time. Believe it or not, uh, you would think that with, uh, with the frequent deployments and the demands on the global war on terrorism, um, a lot of these young kids wanted to join the National Guard. And so we had huge success. Our end strength, the aura, the strength of the Minnesota Guard was never higher, hovering around 117% strength. So for every 100 soldiers, we had 17 more in the books than we needed. But that gave us the ability to respond to both our state missions and our federal missions. So it was an amazing time to be recruiting. Uh, we had a lot of incentives for our recruiters, mostly federally funded. And so we had all the ingredients necessary to be very successful in the recruiting arena. And year over year, we were able to deliver that. Uh, so it was a, an interesting time to be a recruiter, uh, a high pressure time to be a recruiter, but nonetheless, uh, we were successful during that period. Also in 2010, we established our DNI program. Uh, at the time, the Adjutant General, General Rick Nash, thought it was important to start taking a look at how we looked internally, were we reflecting the communities that we serve in, and so established a program. And just keep in mind, we pulled this out of hide. There wasn't a mandate from DOD, a mandate from the National Guard Bureau. We just felt that this was important as an organization to step into this arena and go after this work. We established eight special emphasis councils, or ERGs at the time. Uh, we focused on achieving parity with Minnesota National Guard uh, demographics. We forged a lot of relationships in communities of color. Uh, that was us reaching out to them our initiatives were uh, supported by our senior leadership, um, and we actually had one of our priorities at the time was a standalone priority, specifically focusing on the d diversification of the organization. And so we really established a good framework moving forward um, and, uh, and, moving, and looking into, what, into the following years, we realized that when the pandemic came, uh, we were grateful to the fact that we had a mature program um, when 2020-21 came around. So let's talk about afterwards. Let's really talk about kind of the meat and potatoes of what do we learn as an organization? What are those lessons learned I can impart with you all here in the room? So I call it hitting rock bottom. Now I was the outgoing commander in charge of recruiting. So this is 2020, um, this is March. I mean, we just got back from a trip to Mexico. In fact, we literally landed on Monday and the next day travel was, was restricted um, and the pandemic hit. Um, and it shut down our access to society. Now, prior to this, you know, a lot of our recruits came out of the high schools, about 30 to 40 percent uh, of the market. But if you can imagine that recruiting is a people-driven business, right? It's about relationships. So can you imagine suddenly the doors being shut um, and leading about 100 recruiters and them saying, hey, sir, you know, what do we do? And I honestly didn't have, and you were around, I didn't have a lot of very good answers, did I? Uh, it was a real struggle. So recruiting, in my opinion, came to a screeching halt, right? And then soon after that, the unrest ensued, and we called it the entire National Guard. You know, Minnesota National Guard was on the map, right? Nationally, internationally, everyone knew what was happening in Minneapolis at the time. And so our preparation during that time shifted, quickly shifted from recruiting 
to getting ready for the state active duty in this massive response in response to not just the unrest post George Floyd's murder, but as well as the pandemic um, in the years that followed. Um, and so during that time, we failed to make mission. And this was an emotional event. Um, our recruiting battalion, a history of mission success, of never failing. Like this, this, the, uh, I would say the, the culture was inculcated in the unit where we didn't accept failure. But here we were facing failure for several years straight. Um, it was a dramatic shift for us. But I will tell you, um, we quickly had to learn about becoming more self-aware who we were. And as we reflected back at those time during the unrest and during that pandemic, we started to realize that we had missed some opportunities. Um, I've often told people that when we recruit that next soldier or airman in the organization, when they walk through that door of your armory, you know, they bring their life with them, good, bad, or indifferent, right? Their family problems, their persona, their cult, they bring everything with them. Um, and as leaders, we have an obligation to recognize that. You know, how else do we ask people to be their authentic selves? Um, and I would say that, you know, the military has its own unique military culture, right? I mean, think about it. How many, how many, how many uh, organizations have a mission to go to war, right? Where you're putting, you know, your life at stake, your fellow, your fellow service members at stake. Like, how important it is to have a cohesive team that's there to protect each other? I mean, it's so important. And how do you navigate that when most of your members are part-time, they've got a civilian life. Now imagine this in the context of 2020, George Floyd, but the pandemic. And I realized uh, myself at the time that I think we missed an opportunity that I thought maybe we knew our organization or people, and I don't think we really did. And I'll give you a couple examples. Um, at the time, I was in charge of the recruiting battalion, uh, the Northeast Minneapolis Armory, where I was located at. One of the units came down from Camp Ripley and occupied the building. So I had the luxury of walking the floor at night, talking to soldiers and leaders. And I think it was the second night. Uh, we hadn't yet been deployed out to the streets in large, uh, large volumes yet. But I noticed all the African-American soldiers were huddled in one corner in the corner of the drill floor. Now keep in mind, you know, uh, you know, most units have different structures. You know, they've got four-man teams, 10-person teams, et cetera, um, and they're very diverse. But all these soldiers gathered in one spot in the drill floor, and, and I walked over and talked to them. And I said, well, how are we doing? And I could tell there was a sense for them. They realized that, hey, I don't think anybody asked to think how we thought about all this, right? We were so caught up in preparing for the mission. And just keep in mind, in military culture, you receive an operations order, a mission, and a it's very, very focused, right, about getting the mission done. One team, one fight. But in this particular time, I don't think we realized that we had 500 soldiers that came from the Minneapolis area. And we never bothered to ask, hey, I know we got a mission to get done, but how are you doing? Like, how is your family doing? How are you coping with this? We didn't ask the question, right? We missed an opportunity. And I think it was a day later, and Chris, we remember this, we had the one African-American soldier on the line, and there was a community member from the same background as he was yelling at him in his face the entire time. So here's this young soldier who has proudly sworn an oath to defend the Constitution, the Constitution of Minnesota, and there they are trying to be that upstanding soldier, you know, the mission, and there's that person from the community yelling him in the face. I don't think we prepared them for that. The leadership was prepared for it. And so during this time, I call it this period of self-awareness, we spent a lot of time after this trying to re-understand, hey, what didn't, what didn't we do right? What did we miss? How can we better ourselves in knowing who we are? And I, and I picked up a phrase uh, as, I, as I switched from the battalion commander position to the director of DNI, and I kind of started asking myself, you know, how do you lead people um, you don't know? Like, what does it mean to even know someone today, right? How as organizations do we invest in taking time to know the people that we're asking a lot of? And think about the military. We ask a lot of our military members, right? And we did a lot of internal reflection. And from that, uh, we started asking those hard questions. We started developing uh, opportunities to have those difficult conversations. Our, our ERGs, special emphasis councils, for instance, did a lot more uh, internal communication, asking how we were doing. We started educating the leadership to do a better job of understanding the unique cultures that reside in the Minnesota Guard. Uh, and I was talking to the team earlier after uh, Rico's presentation. Um, 
you know, you think about it, you don't have to sacrifice one culture over another. We know there's a military, we have this military mindset, we have a set of army values that are important to us. Um, you know, but you could be a patriot, you could be proud of the branch that you serve in, um, you can assimilate in the military culture, but you don't have to sacrifice your whole being to do that. And I think we realized after this time frame that we had to rethink and how we message that. Um, because I'm telling you, it is a, it's a tough mission. When you deploy overseas, uh, at the end of the day, when you're on that convoy mission or you're facing a tough situation, maybe some of that those culture differences don't matter at that very point. But I would argue that leading up to that point, when you're asking the most of your team members, all right, what have you done to build that cohesive team? What have you done to build that trust within your team? And I say that's where the work is really at. So, uh, okay, understanding the environment. Uh, so part of the self-awareness, we had to maybe relook at, do we understand the environment we're recruiting in right now? Um, we looked back at our strategic partners. Uh, we had a lot of relationships with diverse communities. But through our efforts in engaging and being involved and being present in the community, we started getting invited to different events. So I'll use the AAPI, the Asia Pacific Islander community. We get invited to everything now, right? The Somali community invites us uh, to be part of their community as well. And it started to shift from us asking to them asking us. And that was transformational because that told us that, hey, I think our message is getting out there. You know, we value being a trusted institution. They're seen as someone they can trust. And so uh, I think Stephen Covey said relationships are built at the speed of trust, right? You can't underestimate what that really means. And I would challenge you, are you investing in those relationships now? And what does it even look like? But we have really turned that around, and it's one of the cornerstones of our efforts as we look at partnerships and what that really means. Um, and so we expanded those diverse centers of influence um, at various levels, at the individual soldier level, at the mid-grade level. Uh, all of our special offices councils or ERGs have an executive champion. That's a general officer or a senior leader because in some communities it really matters. When a general shows up at a Hmong celebration, I mean, you should see them all gather around. I mean, it really matters to them, right? So I would challenge you if you have a problem, hey, get your senior leaders involved. It's really important because they really lead the effort and they can really uh, be that champion for that particular group. We also involved the state demographer. Um, so two times, Susan, Bra uh, Susan Brower came to our organization, spoke to our senior um, executive team to help us understand how Minnesota is changing. We did it in 2021. We did it again in 2023. And she showed us how Minnesota was changing at the county level, at the large uh, uh, metropolitan area. We wanted to know, hey, where do we need to focus our efforts? You know, where are different diverse communities growing or shrinking? And that really helped and uh, focused our recruiting efforts, our recruiting efforts. It helped us focus our messaging efforts. Um, and it was really critical to understand how it was changing and to think strategically, hey, how is this going to look like in five, 10 years down the road? So that was really valuable for us. And when you consider only 23% of Americans age 70 to 24 actually are, are eligible to join, you know, only less than 1% 1 are joining. Um, and during this understanding the environment, uh, we applied a lot of the things that make the military unique. Um, we use a number of strategies to help understand complex problems. One of them is we call the military decision-making process, and the Army has a design methodology process we use to help understand complex problems. And I would tell you, that was critical for us to understand where we were, what happened, and where we're going. So think about the systems in place you have now in your organization. Do you even have the ability to respond to crisis? All right. But in our military culture, it's built into our DNA. It's how we handle business. It makes us and allows us to be reactive in a positive way and to develop really sound, good decision-making process to make informed decisions. And more importantly, how do you apply resources to those problems? Uh, so that was critical for us. It also was a time to understand what was the value proper proposition we were offering new members to come to the organization and also to stay in the organization. Um, and I know that Sergeant uh, Awasana can probably attest that that value proposition has probably changed over the last couple of decades. You know, during the global war on terrorism, it was about being a patriot and contributing, being part of the war effort. But it's changed. And Gen Zers are motivated by different things. And you need to be asking yourself, 
if that's your focus as a customer base, what is their interest and why? All right, if it's your recruiting talent, hey, what's a uh, proposition of being part of your organization? So we took a hard look at that to understand what that looks like. Our internal external engagement, I talked about this earlier about what we changed differently. Look, our special emphasis councils, by and large, they're the cornerstone of our of our DNI team. I mean, without them, I can't imagine we'd be where we are today. Um, we did a lot of cultural panel discussions, and during uh, COVID years, we did a lot of this stuff virtually, so people could call in and virtually see. But what was great about those interactions was we assumed people knew each other in the organization, but during those panel discussions, and we did it for just about every group we had, every affinity group. Um, a lot of folks came away and leaders came away. I didn't know that about Sergeant so-and-so or Captain so-and-so. So it was really good for us as organization to understand the people who were leading. Um, as I said earlier, our route, outreach efforts really, really Im improved. In fact, during uh, the COVID years, uh, our participation in the councils grew by 38%. So people were becoming more aware of the value of being involved in those programs and wanted to be involved in those programs. A couple other things that relates to internal engagement and probably to retention. We have a number of things that we do that helps us understand um, the culture and the direction the organization is going. We have a junior officer and enlisted advisory council. So imagine in a typical corporation, you've got your uh, employee at the, I call it the lowest level, and you have your CEO level. This is an opportunity where the CEO is engaging with uh, the junior members in your organization. It's a year-long program. There's four touch points in the year. And it's an opportunity for those junior members to bring to the senior leadership, hey, here are the challenges that I see from my lens, and a chance to codify them into, into defined problems and potential solutions. And that's been really valuable because the, the soldiers and airmen that participate are across all walks of life. So it's a very diverse group bringing a lot of issues to senior leaders. And it's a great way. It's a great retention tool because now they feel like their opinions matter. At our executive DNI council, uh, we uh, we spent a lot of time in the pre-pandemic years, really educating the senior leaders, and we switched to uh, owning their DNI program versus Corey Robinson driving everything. We actually had some strategic um, priorities established, and we nested those with the governor's one Minnesota plan, and we looked at how we could do a better job in integrating. DNI across the organization. It was a standalone priority, and now it's nested into everything that we do. And we looked at how we leverage our, our strategic partners as well to help us understand the communities at large. So this was pitiful, pit pivotal for us in terms of how we engage internally and externally. Let's talk recruiting retention. Uh, I'll start with the first bullet. You know, we're, Minnesota's changing, right? And we learned that from the state demographer. Uh, we, uh, we had to take a quick look at how we looked internally. And I'll tell you this. When I was recruiting, uh, about 30% of the force coming in was race and ethnically diverse. Um, it's now hovering around 42%, and it peaked about 45 So almost one in two folks coming to the Minnesota Guard is a diverse member of the community. That's a significant change. It's reflected in the fact that Minnesota's changing. But because of that, our recruiting forces also change as well. And I will tell you, when you have a recruiters, uh, let's say, just the Asian, the Asian community, we lost our comms here. When you have recruiters from the Asian community and they walk into a high school in St. Paul, there's an immediate sense of trust and credibility right out of the gate. Right? I can't tell you the value in looking at your recruiting force. Uh, if you look and reflect the communities you serve in, all right, it goes a long way to starting those relations, those connections right away. Um, so we're really proud of the effort we've made there. Uh, the market share we own currently now, when I was in charge of recruiting, our market share is about 40%. Right now, just the reserve component alone, when you look at the Air National Guard, Minnesota Army Guard, and the reserve components of Minnesota, we own 91% or 93% of the market share. That is a significant change in the last several years. And when you look at all branches of service available to Minnesotans, we owned over 70%. That isn't by accident, right? This goes back to brand awareness, how we communicate with the public, all right? The recruiters and their message and where we're present in the community. You've got to be present if you want to recruit. Um, and that's been huge for us. Um, in addition to that, uh, we recognize that our foreign-born recruits, which increases every single year, mostly a lot of recruits from, I would say, from East and West Africa, um, 
I would say our foreign born recruits bring a mindset that's so refreshing because they see the opportunity of the Minnesota Guard and they're the ones that really capitalize on their education benefits. A lot of them are going after their master's degrees. Um, and uh, it's great to see because I think that that uh, that sense of of opportunity I think is 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 um, is viewed viewed upon by our other members as well, and so that's changing dramatically. Um, our state uh, legislature has helped out a lot with the recruiting incentives, which has been very very helpful. And last thing I'll talk about is is we've also focused on the health and welfare of the organization. Uh, a lot of emphasis on the well-being of our soldiers and their families, and so new programs, new initiatives come down from either funded by the state or through the federal side. Uh, we spend a lot of time ensuring that the resiliency and health of our force is really, really important, really, really valuable. valuable. And I think we're getting close on time here, so let me try to wrap it up. I'll talk to Richie Inclusion again really quick. Again, we've seen a lot of uh, increase in our participation um, in, in the various demographics. We are currently on parity with the state of Minnesota, so that we're really proud of that fact, and we're making strides in improving the fact that we're representative at the mid and senior levels. And there's a lot of work to be done there. Um, this work is slow and deliberate, but we're making progress across all of it. Um, Rico, you mentioned about the multicultural setting, um, and I would say that the table at our armories are also changing. We're seeing that. One of the things we realize is that we recruit mostly in the metropolitan area. So imagine recruiting that young person from Somalia, for instance, and they pick up a job as a mutual man in Bemidji, Minnesota. Now, that could be culturally uh, challenging for the unit that's there and the person going there. We have taught ourselves and educated our leaders to understand those cultural differences to help prepare for a better job in assimilating and integrating folks from all different backgrounds across the state of Minnesota. And lastly, I'll talk about how we tell the Minnesota Guard story. Again, the annual report in front of you was a big part of that. Um, that document has transformed over the last decade, I'd say. It literally is a story of the Guard. And in it, you're going to see the diverse nature of the Guard, the unique stories, and how we connect with the community. Um, we spend a lot of time engaging the, pub in the, the, the public. Um, through the Minnesota Brockers Association, we have uh, uh, a lot of support from them. So we advertise on the radio and social media. And Chris and her team does a great job ensuring that we get those stories, the diverse stories that reflects the organization. So think about how you present yourself to the public and those opportunities to tell those stories. Um, we have several things going for us. Can we talk about, um, about your brand? Uh, in the Minnesota Guard, we talk about being always ready and always there. And we talk about that we work here, we serve here, uh, and we live here in the organization. And I would challenge you that take a look at your brand and your message. Is it consistent? How are you missing it? And people know who you are. And I think I'm probably out of time, Rick. So I'll stop with that. Here's a list of key takeaways, and I thank you for your time.